Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the all-in-one cloud-based e-learning authoring tool for teams. You can learn more at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Everybody now. Chair dancing day, everybody. Good morning. Hey, gang. Um, so I'm seeing in the weather reports today that it's actually freezing rain, both for me and for folks in Texas, uh, in Dallas. And that's just blowing my mind. That is absolutely, yeah, like that's one big cloud going on there. You know? <laughs> it's very long. It's yeah. sweeping the nation. <laughs> that's all. Literally. <laughs> that's crazy. Yep. No kidding. Oh, man. Apache Junction. Hey, hello. I'm over in Scottsdale. I wonder if you guys have seen some snow yet. We're supposed to get some snow today. Dino's in Phoenix, too. All right. Awesome night in the chat there. We'll get some. Uh, cool. We'll probably uh, have some uh, snow on cactus pics on the Instagram and the Twitter here today if. Uh, if all goes according to the weather guys, but they're not often right around here. So, you know, I'm not holding my breath, but it's fun when it happens. Neato. I'll be watching for that. It does kind of also trick my brain thinking that how can it snow in Phoenix? How can that happen too? You know? So yeah. anyway, um, folks, we have uh, Dr. Robin DeFelice with us this morning. Robin, it's your first time joining us. Um, so introduce yourself to our gang. Hi gang. I'm Robin DeFelice. <laughs> I don't have too much exciting to say about myself other than hi, I'm Robin. And I like my and I like micro learning and I like data and lots of nerdy fun things and very cool. And comics. Right on. And that there that is go. an awesome mug. Yep, yep. It yep. is fantastic. Thank you. Um Thank you. I will mention, uh, because it, we tossed it into the very beginning of the chat there. Um or Robin, you did. We were talking in the green room before coming in. Now it's not today's topic. But Robin is, is co-author of an article that I turn to a lot when we're talking to you know, new clients, et cetera, who are trying to understand moving from, say, something that's been purely instructor-led training to an e-learning kind of world. Um, and she was co-author of an article in, uh, on ATD's blogs um, about how long does it take to make something. Uh, training, etc., um, and it's a, an awesome resource that I have. I've um, you guys have done it a couple or three versions now, and uh, I've I've even you know from the first one and the updated one, it's a, a link that I share with a lot of folks. So we've tossed that into the chat um, at the top that folks are wondering, but we're not actually we're not talking about that specifically today. Um, today we're talking about small micro micro learning micro Smaller learning topics. Like micro topics and that's in there so this was just a micro topic on a micro topic technically so wow <laughs> okay so now we're getting now we're getting meta about Ooh. micro <laughs> that's uh that's mind-boggling um yeah so, so micro learning i mean it, it's been a term that's been bandied about in our in our space for you know many years now relatively speaking um seems to have some sticking power um do you have a specific sort of definition or, or a characterization of what you consider micro learning specifically? Um, wow, that's a good question to actually start with because new in 2022, um, I actually, as I've been, been presenting over the last two years, I realized we're still grasp, grasping and grappling at that idea of what micro learning is. I think as a con, um, from a consumer standpoint, but also in our field and industry. And what I've come to learn is that though in our book, um, Micro Learning Short and Sweet, Carl, Dr. Carl Kopp and I provide um, what I'd call a dry technical definition of micro learning, which is this um, compilation of synthesizing like several other definitions in the one. And so what is that? And we talk about it being an instructional unit that engages the uh, participant and it elicits, elicits an action. 
uh, the challenge with that is, is we've kind of given a definition to what I would call a micro learning product. So when I said new in 2022, what I was kind of referring to is that I'm now contextualizing a little better that definition because micro learning can be used at different levels as a definition. Micro learning can be used as a concept. How do we want to, um, you know, build some learning over time type of thing? So it's it's not it's not just a thing. It's, you know, it's an approach to focusing on performance or skill development. Uh, micro learning can also be used as a term for method, such as an approach that builds skill over time gradually and oftentimes repetitively. Then it can go to that technical version that we have in our book, which is an instructional unit. So now you're thinking about my micro learning product and I could talk about the things, the tangibles as products and campaigns, because you typically don't have one micro learning product. If you're building something over time, gradually and repetitively, you typically have a campaign very much like marketing. So mm. you put that those pieces together and maybe you drip the, you know, they talk about micro learning or marketing drip campaigns. So in some sense you're doing the same. So I, I think that you met, you know, the question was basic, but over time we've come to, <laughs> over time we've come to learn micro learning means so many different things to so many different people. And for us to, you know, for Carl and I to really articulate it well, we have to say it's a concept, it's a method, and it's also still a tangible product. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it, you, you can talk to folks, um, and get all kinds of different sort of sub variations of what it is. I mean, a lot yeah. of folks think of micro learning as short videos or, uh, you know, and, and also then if you're ending up in a conversation with a vendor uh, or, or something, there's always a slant about you know their version or their interpretation or the product that they've created, right. you know, or, as, as defining it as a micro learning thing too. Or putting a timestamp on it has to be 10 minutes, yeah. six minutes, like back to the article that you were talking about. It defines an average seat time for micro learning as six minutes, but six minutes on an infographic, six minutes in a blog, six minutes in an e-learning, like there's um, one of the things I typically stump folks with when I do presentations is I put up a poster that was actually at a learning conference and the poster was just showing you wristbands. And that wristband meant I want my hands shook. I want you to elbow. I want you to keep your distance. That was micro learning in a poster format mm -hmm. inside an environment. You know what I mean? It And people denied it. You know, some people are like, that's not micro learning. It's not any learning product. It's not digitally transferable. It's not mobile. Um, so to your point, everybody has a different definition. And, and our goal, I mean, in, as instructional designers, our goal is to create, um, you know, changes in behavior. So what does it matter if it's a, a thing on the wall versus a thing on a screen? Um, right. If you're achieving the goal, um, then that's the, that's the, the, the whole, the whole goal. Right. Not and the I micro think, goal, the whole goal. <laughs> the whole goal. And I think that's important to point out is part of um, a big piece of what micro learning has to be for design is contextualized and it has to be boom in the face of that individual. I don't really call them learners. I call them participants because if you're doing your micro learning, right, they're participating. Even that poster, somebody participated. Mm -hmm. They looked at the information. They looked around the room at everybody's wristbands. They might have taken a photo of that poster, right? They engaged. So um, if we're talking about people in a manufacturing floor plant, the only place they may have is wall space mm -hmm. around the manufacturing, you know, work floor to, to put their things up or their information. Think about delivery trucks. Where, where are they all day long inside mm -hmm. a truck? Where would you put information? Probably on the walls inside the truck. Yeah, for sure. Um, time is always something that seems to come up when we talk about micro learning. You've mentioned, you know, the study that you've got showing six minutes is an average. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always struggled with the notion because our our space seemed a, a few years ago anyway, to borrow an idea that I think came out of Google's own studies of, you know, videos shouldn't be any longer than three minutes. I think three minutes mm -hmm. was the was the number that sticks in my brain. And um, mm -hmm. I've always struggled with that concept because the um, the notion of dictating an amount of time for something um, seems to me to be kind of beside the point. The thing that you're teaching people should dictate the time rather than an arbitrary right. you know, value, like all your videos should be three minutes or, or right. six minutes or, or, or what have you. The question is, how long does it take to teach this one objective? Mm -hmm. That's it, because that's what micro learning is about. You're not teaching five different objectives. If you're teaching about how to tie a shoe, your first objective just might be identifying. I mean, I'm I'm distilling down to something mm -hmm. super basic here, but identify the shoe, the pieces of the shoe. That's like one objective. That's it. That would be the micro learning. You might have 
at the most, most micro learning should have one to two. If you're getting over two, now you're just pushing out a piece of training. Um, but again, and then that one or two things you're looking at is something that you're looking at because it's not just a one and done. I only need to identify shoes one time. We're talking about skill development, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, I'm looking at that objective maybe from different angles, like conflict resolution. You need to be able to identify conflict resolution, but how do you identify that? You identify it by listening, visuals, um, body language, you know, the body language, that type of thing. And so you're going to build all these little micro learning pieces that are just about the, the objective of identifying, um, not even the handling, because handling is something different. And then you handle, you have different micro learning pieces to handle, because it might be handling in a professional setting, it might be handling conflict between two subordinates, uh, one leader, one support, there's all six, you know, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of mixtures. Mm -hmm. And those again, again, are one objective at a time. Yeah, yeah. So over in the um, uh, in the chat, Paul has noted the challenge for us uh, as instructional designers, I guess, is manage is management requesting micro learning without a common definition. I think they just want training to be shorter, as usual. Yeah. Um, and, and that's I mean that's another piece of the thing is that sometimes um, people call it micro learning, but really all they've done is they've taken something that was an hour or a half an hour and they've tried to chop it up into, you know, smaller chunks to deliver people to people um, over the over time. Um, and that seems to me to be another you know, kind of a challenge because sometimes things actually take an hour to learn um, and can't maybe if, if something has to be sort of built up in sequence and, and maybe the time in between isn't actually helpful. But that sort of right. sense of arbitrarily chopping something up uh, into small chunks doesn't right. always work either. Right. And I empathize with Paul. So there's a lot of folks in our micro learning space that actually create and build the micro learning. The majority of my experiences has been going in and helping people understand what micro learning is to them and their organization. What I popped into the chat below is an article I wrote for um, a magazine online, but it's about the purpose and potential of micro learning. And all of these articles that I write for this online magazine are focused on the leader and the manager of departments for L&D, because I think they face the greatest challenges in understanding it, because it doesn't just affect them internally, like the skill sets of their instructional designers definitely need to be audited for whether or not they have the strengths to do it, um, let alone your resources and your capabilities, like do you have the right tools in place? Do you have external assistance? Because typically when you start doing micro learning, if you're really looking at performance based pieces, now you're looking at data and different types of data that you may have never collected, your company may not have the technology to collect it. So um, purpose and potential is almost start, you know, the base, the ground level of understanding, because you may understand inside your own department of L&D what micro learning is, but until you start to do that change management discussion with leaders, what they're expecting, um, they may really only want to Paul's point, they might just want something more like a micro training, a bite sized piece of learning, what they really, they may not really want micro learning, micro learning to me again, as a concept is provable performance and skill development. If you're not doing the proving, which isn't mm. completion rate inside of an LMS, it's not competency proficiency at time of taking this intervention of learning. It's over time. You know, um, for example, Dr. Carl Kopp, who's the other author on micro learning short and sweet right now, he's doing research. Um, I think it's called I look it up dot org. But anyway, it's um, mandated reporting with teachers and they're researching how much of an impact micro learning products have on these mandated reporters at three, six and nine months. Are they seeing a better compliance towards reporting, reporting only when there's an actual reportable piece? as opposed to, I think this is, I'm not sure, so I'll report, right? So now you can actually start to begin to see, does that data, does the micro learning demonstrate that people over time are improving what they're reporting on and the accuracy of what they're reporting? So there is something provable. If your organization's not looking for something like that, then you're probably not really in the micro learning space. You're in micro training, or micro lessons or something else. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and um, you know, reporting, um, and measuring is something that we should always be doing. Uh, but so often it's, it's all about content. It's the, oh, we, people need to know this. So let's take it and, and push it out somehow at people. Right. Um, I, I want to bump to Chris's question in the chat. It says, is sure. what defines micro learning one learning objective? Again, um, at the beginning, I said it's at the core of a product, a micro learning product, it would be one objective and a product I use a lot of cooking terms and food terms. 
So let's look at it this way. From a concept, the concept is, is I have a party and I want it to be bread based. And then, you know, I have um, a method. I want to give you bread and slice it up, right? So my products are slices of breads and the campaign is the loaf. And so my micro learning product will have one to two objectives I'm focusing on, but the total of those slices will create a campaign or a loaf of bread, which helps us meet some type of goal, even if it's not the total goal. It could just be um, the goal for new onboard hiring, the micro learning campaign you created. It's, the goal is just to teach company culture and policies of that nature, like DEI, over the first 15 days. And then over 45 days, you're looking to see that the new hires embodying those philosophies in the culture and they're integrating it into their work habits. And then you look at it again in 90 and you know maybe 120 or something like that. So yes, I am defining micro learning products to having one to two objectives maximum, but as a concept and as a method, it's a much larger conversation that goes beyond one, one objective. Mm -hmm. How about in the chat, anybody in the chat actually want to throw out a project that you're working on that you think is micro learning, but you want to double check and see if you're doing a concept or, uh, <laughs> is it micro learning or not? Yeah. Is that the game this morning? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> no kidding. Bring it, bring it. It's and, and here's, and here's some great things to ask yourself. I actually do this. Um, uh, let me just, there's some, some questions I have people ask themselves. Um, you know, depending on your learning product, if you've developed a learning product and are calling it micro learning, are you calling it that because it's less than a certain amount of time? If you're saying yes, then I'm going to tell you in my, my professional opinion, you're not doing micro learning. Um, if you're just taking a larger training initiative and breaking it into smaller pieces, but you haven't done anything to make each of those pieces stand alone. And again, focus on only one to two objectives and build a story of performance growth or skill development, something like that. If you haven't done that, then it's not micro learning. So again, think about um, an annual piece of training. You like, I just want to break it down so it's over the next four weeks. It doesn't make it micro learning. You just broke something down to make it easier to deal with in four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are some of the things I ask people as I come in because I think somebody said it earlier. I think maybe you, Chris, and then um, somebody in the chat, but. You go into leadership and I was working with a vendor. They brought me in because they had a challenge. The, the company said, we want micro learning for our sales force. And so vendor went off and did, but as soon as they brought the product back, the client was like, but you're missing this. You're missing this content. You're missing this content. And their micro learning piece turned back into the 40 minute seat time e-learning product again, because there's that, you know, they, the vendor did not realize they needed to have a much more baseline conversation of, what is your purpose and potential for this? Are you seeking to have a return on investment of some site? You know, whether it's efficiency, quality, performance, compliance, whatever it is, what are you looking for? And a lot of people associate micro learning with just performance growth, upskilling, reskilling, um, uh, remediation. It can be for any one of those things. It's not just one, one thing. It's really a great, great way to approach things. Um, so Kevin's saying the micro learning I'm trying to deliver is getting managers to define the business issue before they ask for a learning product of expertise. <laughs> so you want to create micro learning on micro learning, Kevin? <laughs> yes, I would say that is a uh, that would be a valuable product that I think you could sell to a lot of companies. Well, it's interesting. So Kevin, it sounds like what you're trying to do is build an understanding of the business service area for the L&D department, and you're trying to educate in different ways. So if you're building a small series, and it could be um, podcasts, it could be a blog, it could be, you know, it could be um, a web page or an article, it could be a quick video. I don't think one item is going to do it, right? So here's, here's, um, Kevin's campaign. Kevin's campaign is looking at what's our service area. That's one objective. And that, that a service area is what we can and can't do for you. But then it's how, how do we work together more um, closely as a service to you to help you define business needs. And then you might have a series on just defining his loaf of bread could just be about de defining a business need and what are the components of that? There's usually a process in identifying it. Each one of those micro learning pieces could be a tangible item that he creates that helps them to identify the next step. And it's almost like building homework over time, which would totally be a micro learning thing. 
because you're eliciting action. So for step one, you're identifying the needs. So maybe this one's just about brainstorming or going and collecting data. And here's a worksheet for you to put that data down. That's step one. Step two, now articulate, you know, the plan of it. How do I see that over time? What do I need to have as a priority first to address in my business need? I could see Kevin building this out into a micro learning. So yes, mm -hmm. I, I hear the possibility, Kevin. And if, um, you know, you go forth with any of my ideas, I ask for at least like a 1% royalty um, <laughs> in, the in the form of coffee or comic books. I'll take either. Um, I'm totally joking. <laughs> I'm totally joking, <laughs> but it does have legs. If that's what you're thinking of doing, I can see it. And I, yeah. I think that you have a smart move on your hand because then look at, um, you could start to look at the cost benefit of what you've done. Are you chasing down squirrels all the time and creating projects and products that really don't fail? Or I mean fail because they don't have that plan behind them and a true business need. So how much more is your service area now providing a true service and a return on investment for the company. So the L&D department wins and so do the departments that um, go through your process. There's there's a lot of data you could collect out of it that would be super beneficial. Okay. And Kevin, don't forget the recording is here afterwards. So if you haven't, if you've been taking notes and you've missed anything, you can come back and review this because you just got a powerful brain dump of, uh, of ideas there to follow up on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Something that Dino's mentioning in the chat, what's the relationship between microlearning um, and a job aid? And that's another place where sort of the, what is microlearning becomes kind of, you know, blurry. Is it, um, you know, is it formal preparatory learning or is it something that um, people use in the, you know, in a time of, of need just in time or, or that, and even just the relationship then say between a, a formal job aid and microlearning too. Formal or f informal, and it could be push or pull. You could be pushing it out, or you could um, the person could be pulling it. Think of a middle, you know, some managers. You might push them before performance evaluations. A little four week series of this is how you write equitable performance reviews, and this is what we expect for consistency and yada yada. Or it could be, hey, it's time for performance reviews. Here's some resources, and I can choose to pull them as opposed mm. to them being pushed to me. Um, you know job aids they some people poo poo them as micro learning but are you know are we developing so again the question is is it skill over time or is it just an aid because i need to recall something today um i still think they both have their place mm -hmm. i don't i don't think either one is wrong i just wouldn't necessarily say every job aid is micro learning it depends on the purpose of why you design that job aid is it just to support today in the moment like how do we use um you know crowdcast uh, and I just need to refer to it, or are you really trying to create a crowd cast service representative that supports you? Then mm -hmm. those job aids might be something as part of a more formal training. So until they feel confident to be that service support person, they have job aids to rely on. I it just, it's mm -hmm. all on how you're going to use it. I do, and again, I think we shouldn't get caught up in semantics of it. I yeah. think what organizations really need to do, and I, I think I was driving at it lately, but one, one of my presentations is, is the five challenges of integration. And the first thing I tell people to do is sit down and define it. Define it for your team, go out and talk to your stakeholders, make sure that that definition is um, something that they understand or that they see value in. You might find value in it and your company may not. So move with what the company's needs are don't try to change the world through micro learning, so to speak, you know, one step at a time, micro steps, no joke, take it one step at a time. And most times it's have a conversation first, try to understand what your company really wants and what they're trying to um, achieve and what you're trying to offer, because those two things might not be syncing up. You see a vision, they might not see that vision. I think that's probably one of the biggest issues that instructional designers and training teams have is that we all come together like this on Idiotic or blogs and LinkedIn, and we all think that everybody just knows and is in, as engaged in all of this stuff as we are. And then we get shocked when we try to implement something that we've been studying and trying so hard to do, but then they say, like to your example earlier, that, that it ends up just being <laughs> another long e-learning, uh, you know, at the end of the day. And so um, I, I think a lot of it is change management too, right? And it's like, you got to get the, it, it's selling anything, right? It's like, you, if you're going to you. change what you're doing, if you're going to change what the training team does, you have to educate the whole entire company on this new idea. And that is not an easy task. <laughs> 
So thank you for saying that, Brett, because you know what? It's it's 100% true. And it's, again, part of my conversation that I talk about because there's change management at two, kind of two levels, right? It's change management for the people um, that need to lift and create it and get the buy-in. Then there's the change management in the company culture. What if this is the whole new way of providing training to your the masses of your organization? So there's an adoption factor that you need to do and you need to have people again on board and change management, in my opinion, just in general with instructional technology and design and initiatives we do, people gloss it over so much. And in this instance with micro learning, if you don't have your finger on change management from the start, I think you have a problem because again, we articulated a couple of things that really define micro learning and that's provable data. And, and this is the one I focus on a lot is what if you're just trying to simply do, let's say, an email campaign for, again, let's go back to new hires. That email campaign, you're going to want to know if your new hires open that email, clicked through to the links in that email. What if your organization doesn't collect data like that? You're sitting outside of your own department. Now you're asking for resource in another department. You might be asking for technology or services that the organization doesn't have. That is also change and change management that needs to be done. So you, you really hit on a piece that I think what people say, I got burned by micro learning. These are some of the reasons why they did get burned by trying it. So now that you have that information in hand, revisit the idea for your organization. Just don't throw out micro learning because it didn't work the first time. Yeah. It's interesting. I'd like to go back up. I, I hate to leave somebody hanging that asked such a great question. And let me go back up to uh, Bob Weiss dropped in. Couldn't a course that uses a series of short three to five minute videos interspersed with assessments, skill exercises and practice assignments for, quote, learning and long term memory benefits be an example of micro learning benefits, but over a longer overall period of time, perhaps 30 minutes or longer? I feel like Bob's talking about the product. Um, oh, it's a uh, not luminosity. There's a uh, an app that you can use, and it like it's actually mm. for memory. It like you can do math skills, oh. writing skills. Yeah. I, um, but anyway, it's like that, and I feel like that's what he's saying here, where um, you get these little activities, and you um, over time you're building up a skill. And some of it's for recall of grammar and punctuation. Some of it's just quick math skills, like averages and tips and percentages. Um, but I'm not sure if that's what Bob's like, saying. Well, I guess at the bottom line is, is something like that micro learning, I guess. Would, would we define that as micro learning? I'm, I'm still trying to process it. I wish mm -hmm. I could say one way or another for you, Bob, like I'm like, but I don't want to take up the whole time asking a hundred questions towards it. <laughs> um, but if it's one chorus and it's a course that, I mean, if you're sitting again, now we get back to seat time, right? If they're sitting and they're working on more than one learning objective at a time, it's not really micro learning. If they're not collecting data long-term against typically a business goal of some sort, whether I'll go back, I keep going back to new hires, but if it was new hires, are we reducing the amount of turnover? Are we um, getting them fully competent in their job role uh, and independently working in less time? If it's middle managers being trained, are they showing consistent competency in certain skill sets to be promoted to a manager? Um, and how do we help them get there? Uh, those are the kind of things that we would look at. If Bob, if some of that says yes to you towards the question you're asking, then you probably do have something that's micro learning based on your hands. Mm -hmm. He says, yes, one course using several modules that intersperse video in short segments with skill practice, homework, assignments, etc. Right. So eliciting action is a big part of micro learning. If you're just having them take in knowledge and just sit there kind of very uh, Pavlovian, so to speak, <laughs> um, <laughs> then it's not that's a big piece of the the technical definition Carl and I give is it's eliciting action. So that's eliciting action and it's perpetuating their skill. And I would assume that they're growing their skill over time. So those homework assignments aren't just regurgitation. It's about making you take the information, process it and use it in a contextual way. If you're doing that, then you really are serving up to um, a micro learning style product. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Nyla, who's been a guest with us previously, shout out to Nyla, hello, um, asks in the question panel, one question about semantics, people keep associating microlearning and modular, modularization. Interested in how we explain different similarities and if it's wrong or right to conflate the two. And it feels kind of like a, a similar question to what Bob was, was posting up, you know. Um, so, and, and you've talked about the loaf of bread and, and slicing mm -hmm. it up, I mean, uh, modularization, uh, you know, or simply just chunking versus um, micro learning, are they the same or, or are they, you know, what, what's the differences? That was kind of that, have you taken a big training mm -hmm. and, you know, people are like micro learning, I'll just take this training and chop, 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 you know, no. If you're chunking things, well, let's, I feel like this is mm -hmm. the coffee, coffee talk of semantics. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, it because, always is in L and D, right? It's always comes down to semantics. Right? Well, if let's say you're chunking, but you're chunking to a SCO, right? A shareable content object. And SCOs, if you're LMS driven or familiar, we know that a SCO is typically one objective. So if you've modularly broken something down to one objective or maybe two, and then you've associated actionable um, activities you know, activities or engagements, even if it's self-reflection, like reflect on the last time you did X and um, create a plan that would, you know, alter that or whatever. That's all micro learning. But if you take a module and you say, well, I'm taking these four lessons out of the module and I'm making this one piece and this, this is, no, that's not micro learning because that's four lessons. And those four lessons may have three to four learning objectives per lesson. We're not in the micro learning realm. So they're definitely, again, and, and then that ties me back to a <laughs> Groundhog's Day here. Again, have a conversation with your internals on what you want the definitions to be for your organization. I actually advocate for that all the time. If you're not going to hold a true definition like I'm perpetuating today, define it for your company. It's almost like a charter. This is how we see it. This is how we're going to value it. This is how it's going to drive and serve our organization. If you've got that in place, you could call it pink and purple polka dots. I don't care. <laughs> just make sure it works, right? You just it, It's got to work for what you're envisioning your organization's wants and needs are. Is there any, like, um, as you were mentioning that, it just dawned on me that, you know, uh, we've got a module level of, you know, creating a course or something. And then we've got that lesson level, but we're still not at that micro learning yet. Is it, is it worth us maybe, and maybe you did this in your book. I apologize if it's already there, but like, are there, is there a number of questions that people can ask, say, Hey, can we, is, is this smaller or can you keep asking questions or, or what is this small enough to be one thing or is it, two things or how, I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but as you go from the, that bigger training and you're trying to assess how small down to go in that structure or in that content before you've nailed it and you're like, yes, this is now, I believe going to be a micro learning. Um, is, is there an easy way to do that? Or is this the way you shouldn't do it? Oh, okay. So one of the easiest things I like to do, and I should have pulled it up to share is I am, and there is in the book, I think it's chapter five, but there's um, a design uh, strategy map. And so oh. in the, and in the book, so you break it down so that um, you're looking at it like, uh, yeah, it's chapter five, um, micro learning map. <laughs> it's a little map but it helps you to break it down. So you're looking at what's the task, what's the performance criteria. So now you're really, this is the thing about micro learning people don't think about. There's three things, like we all know training takes time and planning. But with micro learning, think about the planning you have to have in place to actually create a campaign. Think about that loaf of bread, those slices, you really have to think about each one of these slices. So this is what the map is. The map is one slice of bread. So you're literally creating a slice at a time to build up to a campaign. So you're looking at the task, you're looking at the performance criteria, how will they perform it? What are the objectives? One or two. And then how, what is the motivation behind it? I make, I make people think about these things in the beginning, because if it's, well, just to get them to learn, you're not motivating them. You have to understand that even the way you design micro learning, how you write it, how you create it, everything you do is not what you're commonly used to doing. So to go back to the question, 
is there a way that you can break down micro learning? There's different ways you can create and achieve micro learning. You can do like a top down, like this is our company's ROI or KPI. This is where education or training is going to fit in. These are the specific topics out of it that might work well for micro learning. And you could go this way or you could go up. You could go from one slice at a time. I, you know, you might conceptually say, I want this skill or, or uh, performance measure of some type, you know, and then, okay, well, what are all the things like active listening? People think one micro learning and active listening is not is enough. No, it's not. You need to understand again, kind of like conflict resolution. You could tell when somebody's listening to you or not. Um, you can, you know what I mean? There's certain things that you need to know. So then you could build up that way. First, I'm going to tell them what active listening is. And then I'm going to tell them in another micro learning what our company's philosophy on active listening is and how we have to uphold it. And then I'm going to teach you skills that help you become an active listener. And I'm going to teach you skills that help you see when other people are not actually actively listening to you. Um, and then I'm going to teach you skills on how to achieve being either A, a better listener or B, a person that's saying, hey, you're not listening to me. Um, I need you to pay attention. How do I handle a person that's not actively? Because that's that's conflict resolution a little bit. So you can go top down, bottom up. It doesn't matter. But um, in the book, we go bottom up to try to just get you to think. I think the greatest challenge is thinking singularly. And that's why we started bottom up, because it kind of forces you to look at your big picture alternately. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, we get caught up in the big picture all the time. This is the training we have to do, you know. Safety yeah, we see mountains. Clients. We, we typically see mountains uh, when they're when these things are handed to us. And, and uh, um, here, here's a, um, something that we haven't really talked about. I mean, we talked about what is micro learning, uh, et cetera. But why? Why micro learning? Like why it versus something else? Recognizing that it's a tool. But but right. what are the you know, what are the values? What are the benefits? Why should we why should we think about this? If we look at it from a product standpoint, this is where I think that it gets that confusion going where it's, well, it's easily accessible. It's in, you know, you bigger what is. Um, so there's benefit in it fits to the flow of everybody's workday. You're not being interrupted as much to sit mm -hmm. down and maybe take a four hour workshop on compliance. You're being fed your compliance over time. Um, it's intentional, targeted, focused pieces. So there's benefit to that. You're really trying to develop a performance outcome, whether that's performance or skill. Um, so there's benefits where people say it's mobile, it's this, it's this, it's this. And then the other piece, I think the benefits really are is we're in the, the early stages. And I mean, for us in our field, we're always 10 to 20 years ahead of our, our game. Everybody's coming up to us, our, our clients, our businesses, you know, even LMSs, you know, they kind of grew over the last umpteen years. And because of the pandemic, they finally, people that were like laggards are finally saying, oh, I need an LMS. Um, there's the benefit is becoming the performance driven aspect of it. We're, we're looking at reskilling and upskilling our hot topics right now. We're always looking at the performance of a person and what that means to our business. And if that's, if those words are just said, just like that, but then there's no data to back it up and prove it. You're only having half the conversation as an organization and you, you're kind of talking out of both sides of your mouth. And I don't have a better way to say it. That sounds a little ugly, but that's not what I'm trying to say. It's you, you're wanting it, but you're not actually achieving it. So to me, the benefit of micro learning totally is if you really are focused on the future of performance driven information, skill growth and development, investing in your talent at home in your organizations, then micro learning is the way to go because you're doing it in a measured way that um, allows your organization and the people within it to figure out their best pathway to learning. And so another hot topic that's coming up is how to challenge and advocate individuals and organizations to create their own personal learning environments and their own personal learning growth paths. If you do stuff like this, this is definitely going to get you there. Because again, think about that informal push pull kind of thing. Now you can start informally pulling what you need and building curriculums that help you develop the skills that are very important to you, not a broad brushstroke of everybody needs to comply. Everybody needs to understand diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's more meaningful when you can contextualize it to your own learning needs. So you can provide that great opportunity as a base, but then allow people to begin picking and choosing. So I see the benefit of it being a pathway to other options and opportunities to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, I think of it too, uh, uh, as you were describing that, uh, it, it also helps us solve in a sense, the classic problem that it, we have as instructional designers, which is here's the PowerPoint, 
can you make this into an e-learning course? Which, you know, then we struggle to say, well, what's the stuff that people really need? Well, no, they need to know everything. You know, well, what do they need to know to do this? Well, they need to know everything. Well, what do they right. need? You know, uh, so right. in, in some ways it, it kind of distills the, that, that process that we, you know, have to undertake anyway. Uh, right. And it gives us, by the way, it's got to be short. Oh, right. Now I get why we can't tell them everything. Phew, exactly. They it's the 80. That. It's the 80 20 rule flipped on its head. It's mm. only 20%. It's not the 80, you know, usually we say in training, tell me the 80% of what they need to do, know to do their job. The other 20% they'll figure out as they go because it's something that's a one off. Here it's what's the 20? What is literally the 20% of what they need to know to do that exact thing in this moment? That's it. Yeah. It is. I think that's a great way to look at it for sure. I just, uh, I'll give a quick shout out to Ed, good friend of Domino. Um, he's he says Brent so difficult, and I think he was um, mentioning in in terms of the change management. And um, I will tell you guys that from from last week's episode, uh, somebody in the chat who's also a friend um, mentioned a project that he was working on and what he did at his uh, credit union that he works at, and so he's going to be a guest within the next uh, few weeks. And he's going to tell us how he did that culture change and mm. uh, how he went through it. So we have an actual manager of a training department who's gone through this incredibly difficult, thank you, Ed, uh, process of, you know, culture change and trying to move an organization in one direction. And he has a lot of lessons learned, a wrong way to do it and a right way. And a, I'm super excited to have that conversation with him because uh, it's, it's fun to get people out there on the front lines that are trying to do this stuff that you're talking about and, um, and, and for them to be allowed to share it with us is, is very, very cool. Mm -hmm. So let's see, this supports cognitive load approaches to learning design. You know, I think we could still screw that up, Kim. Uh, I think, <laughs> I think uh, I think some people I think micro some micro learnings could still contain significant cognitive load because they're right. trying to cram too much into that micro thing. <laughs> right. And I and I always tell people that um, try to move away from cognitive and think effectively, affective. Right. Um, there's the taxonomy for blooms. When I, I actually teach a micro learning design course, and one of the things I tell them is, is you need to be focused on the effective domain. And we go over the taxonomy, we look at it because it's usually a first introduction for most people. They're used to talking at and speaking at you in training. This is totally different. It's uh, getting you to acknowledge it for you to invest in it, you know, even the way you design it. For example, there's a great product that, um, my student created and it was about active listening and we worked over four iterations for him to redesign and redesign the wording and phrasing to sit there and make a person actually think about how they would treat a person in the situation that was presented so a lot of effective domain does tap more into motivation and emotions and self-efficacy and so you have to write more styled like that. And typically those are like that storytelling or cases or day in the life or what would you do, um, yep. you know, or a personal story, your CEO. Why, why am I even the CEO of this company? Why do I believe in it enough for you, the new hire to be and who's to be here? You know, that type of thing. And this is the culture we embrace and this is how we end up uphold it. So again, everything is not about, I need to tell you this so you know it and you will tell me in five days that you still know it. That's not really the point of micro learning. Mm -hmm. And we know those sorts of things, storytelling, et cetera, also, also uh, really are strong ways of moving things into, you know, longer term memory uh, and deeper understanding, as opposed to just simply throwing the facts at people and, uh, and hoping they stick yeah. like spaghetti to the wall. Is it done? It's micro learning. It's done. Just the it's facts, ma'am. <laughs> Come and get it. Micro learning's ready. <laughs> It's just mix it up in a pot and then you have training, right? That's our cooking uh, analogy today. Robin, thank you so much for being <laughs> thank here today. You. This has been an absolutely wonderful. awesome uh, conversation. You've tossed your uh, your LinkedIn information in there so folks are looking for you uh, to connect with you afterwards. Um, and I think we've added the link to your book uh, that you did with Carl Kopp. Um, yeah, somewhere back, back up in the chat, I dropped it in. Chat. We've had so many links. This has actually been like the most link intensive uh, <laughs> chat that we've had in a while. 
Um, speaking of LinkedIn, we do have our own LinkedIn group uh, for uh, instructional designers and officers drinking coffee, the idiotic LinkedIn group. Got um, it right there. Got it tossed in there. Join us there oh, yeah. uh, and uh, follow up with uh, extra info, etc., and so on. Robin, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been absolutely so much fun uh, and, and so helpful too. And, and awesome chat as always with the gang in the, uh, in the discussions there. Gang, Indeed. we'll see you next week. Let's dance on out of here, though. Have a great Wednesday. If you're joining us live, have a great whatever day if you're listening to us on the audio downloaded podcast group. Thanks, guys. And enjoy the weather you. wherever you are. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody.